You fix my hair. I look all right. You look great. And so I want to welcome everyone to the China U.S. Women's Foundation's uh, weekly Zoom session. Today we're going to uh, talk about entrepreneurism with Jack Killian. Uh, Jack. Jack uh, has successfully launched and built nine different businesses in publishing, manufacturing, investment services, real estate development, and others. Um, a consultant to C-level leaders while with McKinsey and Company, he has served on multiple corporate and charity boards. He holds a BS in mechanical engineering degree from Yale and an MBA from MIT Sloan School. So welcome, Jack. So glad to have you here. Um, many of us uh, are entrepreneurs and want to be entre successful entrepreneurs. So it's really um, a great opportunity for us to hear from a master. Um, so maybe you could just say a few words about your career, um, the businesses you built and what you think it takes to be successful, especially during a, an uncertain time. Sure. Uh, first of all, I appreciate being here and talking to a group of motivated people. I think it's terrific. And I think going forward, to be successful, everybody's going to have to think and act in an entrepreneurial way. So I don't just equate entrepreneurism with smaller startup companies. I think even people running major organizations have to have to think and behave as an entrepreneur you know, take advantage of all the opportunities, leverage scarce resources. So when I talk entrepreneurship, I'm talking in a broader sense. Uh, my life really breaks down into two halves. Up until about age 30, it was pretty conventional. I went to, you know, good colleges, Yale, MIT, and took some courses at the Harvard B School, and then worked in England for a British technology company they wanted to hire one American MBA student to help set up an internal management consulting group in London. And I was lucky enough to get the offer. But while I was over there, I got drafted into the army. I had to quit my job, come back home, spend two years as a private in the US Army. And when I came out of there, I joined McKinsey and Company, one of the top consulting firms in the world. And there I was consulting with all C-level executives of Fortune 100 type companies. And um, I was on a relative, relative fast track to becoming a partner. They start talking to me very early on about becoming a partner. And uh, it made me face up to realizing I probably didn't want to do that the rest of my life. So the day they actually raised the possibility of nominating me for partner at the end of the year, I went back up into my office and I was working late and I called my wife and I said, hey, Judah, I just made two decisions. And she said, what are they? I said, we're going to buy a racehorse. And she said, when are we going to do that? I said, I don't know. We don't have much money. So we have to find a cheap horse to get started. And she said, what else did you decide? I said, I'm going to quit my job. And she said, when? I said, tomorrow morning. And she asked me why, and I told her. And I actually went down the next morning and talked to uh, the partner who had talked to me about becoming a partner. And I explained, I thought, you know, I shouldn't lead them on, that I really thought I should go off and do other things. And it took me three or four months to actually leave the firm. But at, at the end of that period of time, and it kept sweetening the offer, but at the end of that time, I left. And I left with a vision of, of going into business, of helping small companies raise money. And I had no experience doing that. I had no clients, I had no sources of funding, I had no office space, no help, no real money, no business cards. And that's how I started my entrepreneurial career. And I've been on my own ever since. So uh, I spent five years doing that. And that's really where I got my PhD in business. Because I looked at thousands of deals, most of them were terrible. Most of them are really badly flawed for a variety of reasons. Uh, got involved in a couple that made some sense. The most noteworthy deal we got involved in, and I picked up two partners along the way who thought I was having a lot of fun doing all this stuff. So they quit their jobs and came with me. And uh, we got involved in helping launch Rolling Stone magazine. 
because we could see that that was viable. So, you know, after five years of uh, trying to help others uh, raise funding, I said to my two partners, you know, this is a lousy business model. If we're so smart, we should figure out our own business, go raise money to start it and start. So they, they agreed with that. And um, I wanted to start an investment advisory service, a subscription-based service that I think would still work today. It's still in the back of my head to do it. And my partner who was from Texas, one of my two partners, he had been head of marketing at Columbia Records. He thought we should start the first national country music magazine. So uh, we debated back and forth to do the magazine at back then, you know, 40 years ago, we had to raise half a million dollars and uh, we were debating what to do. Then I saw an article in the New York Times that Harper's Magazine was in trouble, financial trouble. So I called my two partners up and I said, I'll make you a deal. Let's call the people that own Harper's, see if we can talk them into hiring us because we're now experts in publishing to turn around Harper's, but they also have to put up a half million bucks and they can own part of a startup country music magazine. Well, we made that call and we got that deal done. So one part about being a successful entrepreneur is you always have to be looking for opportunities and they are everywhere. You know, I probably have run across three opportunities today and it can be pretty tiring keeping all this stuff in your head, but there are opportunities everywhere. And with, uh, you know, I think COVID-19 is just spurring the rate at which entrepreneurism is gonna take hold. And it's, and it's gonna be a, a global phenomena. Social media is making it easier and easier for people to launch things and reach new markets. So I, I think entrepreneurs have never had a brighter future than they have now. So I, I could go on, you know, after country music, uh, I stayed with that project for five years. And in the second year, we're the second fastest growing consumer magazine in America. And I was about five years into it when my dad died, who had a messed up small industrial equipment manufacturing company. He dropped dead on a Saturday. I had not been involved either with him or with the company. I went down to his office that afternoon, went through his desk, saw that he had about $23 in the bank, owed about $2 million, most of it personally guaranteed. So that's, that's what killed him. He didn't know what to do Monday, right? So I called his accountant. I told him what had happened. I met with the accountants on Sunday and they said, yeah, we've been trying to talk him into bankrupting the company. I said, yeah, but if you do that, they're going to go after my mother's car and her house and her teeth. And I said, I think I got to come in here and try to make this better. They said, you're already running two magazines and you don't know anything about this business. You haven't been involved in it. I said, unless you've got a better person to try to impact this place, it's got to be me. So I started working there Monday and I started with 23 bucks in the bank and owing $2 million dollars and enough personal cash to make Friday's payroll. And I, we got that company going and I never raised the dime of debt or equity to, to grow it. And I grew it into a pretty substantial international company that I eventually sold to a British public company, went on their board and we did 10 acquisitions in three years. And then that whole company got sold. So, you know, I follow things in, in the case of the manufacturing company, I had no real passion for it, but I had a passion for preventing my family from getting massacred from the debt that my father had accumulated. And, uh, you know, I've developed a passion for developing businesses. That's my passion. I love starting things from scratch. I think I'm pretty good at it. I think I know how to do it. And, uh, you know, ever since, ever since I sold that company, I've pursued things I'm really interested in. The racehorse business being one of them. Judy and I started with one horse and eventually got up to 25 horses that we owned our 
selves. And I personally have delivered about 100 baby horses. So I think one of the tricks to being a successful entrepreneur is you really have to get into it. You really have to get your hands dirty. You have to learn every aspect of the business and you got to become good at every aspect of the business. So I've been wondering if anybody has any questions or comments or I could keep going for hours or I could shut up for hours. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. Why a racehorse? When I was a little kid, my father used to take me to the track. And this is back when racing was a big time deal. And I just, I just loved every aspect of it. Not particularly the gambling, but I really liked the pageantry of it, the competitiveness of it, the ability to identify with a horse or a jockey and become passionate about it. So some kids, you know, grow up wanting to get a PhD from Harvard. I grew up wanting to own a racehorse. And, and God punished me because we wound up owning 25 of them. I shouldn't have been so passionate. Okay, of all things, I was just wondering why a racehorse. But it makes sense. Oh, I'm, I'm also an animal person. Okay. You know, right now we have a cat and an English bulldog. I, we have a 10 month old granddaughter, our first grandchild. I just bought her two baby goats for her 10th birthday. So now she's in the goat business. Thank you. Thank Jack, you. I was curious, what was the name of the uh, magazine, the Country Western magazine? It, we, we agonized for months over what to call it. And we finally decided country music. <laughs> and it was great. It's so obvious, right? <laughs> but it was great. That's great. And in every company that I've been involved in, I, I've learned lessons. So, you know, I wrote my first book about networking and my second book is about 90% done. And the working title has been there, done that. Because I think I've been there, I've done that. And I take each chapter of my life and I write about it. And then I distill the lessons I learned that I think apply to any business leader, regardless of the type of organization they're running. So for example, in country music, one of the real lessons I learned was the importance of having multiple revenue streams. So we started out just selling advertising and selling the magazine, either on newsstands or subscriptions and we ran into trouble selling advertising and I told my two partners we got to change our business model because we're not going to make it on ad sales so we start publishing books so we probably published 40 country music mag type of books we launched a syndicated weekly newspaper column that generated revenues we produced our own weekly one hour syndicated radio show on a couple thousand stations got very involved in direct mail marketing, became one of the bigger marketers on TV of country and gospel music. So I've applied that same lesson to every venture I've been involved in ever since. So for Street Smart Entrepreneurs, we're gonna do online courses. We're gonna do online and in-person events. We're gonna do strategic consulting. I'm thinking we should have an investment fund. I'm thinking we should maybe start an incubator because you can't just rely on one or two revenue streams. It's a great question. Um, but during a pandemic, it seems so insecure and fraught every day, especially with an election. And uh, money seems to be tighter and uncertain. What do you say to people who say, well, I just don't feel comfortable right now um, is, are they right just to say, okay, I'll wait till things clear up? That's not my personality or my instinct. I'm not a waiter. I think if you see an opportunity that really strikes a chord with you, I don't think there's ever a bad time to pursue a good opportunity. And, uh, you know, I think there's a, this is a very big world that we live in. There's a lot of people in it. So just the fact that money may be a little scarce, I'm sure there's somebody in the world that has money to put up to do a viable new deal if I have an idea for a viable new deal. I, I think there's always resources. 
you might have to scramble, you might have to work harder, but you know, part of being the success at this stuff is, is out working the next guy. You know, I don't, every day of my life is a Tuesday now. I don't have weekends. So I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I've been through bad times with the various ventures. I mean, I was running a fund of hedge funds during the market collapse. And I, I found ways to, to excel in that period of time. So I've been through it with the manufacturing company when, when the market was, was tanking, the industrial equipment market. So I, I think, you know, this is a big world and there's a lot of places to maneuver, a lot of opportunities and life is short. You know, I'd rather be trying something today than wait a year to try something. I may not be around a year from now. So if I spot an opportunity, somehow I like to pursue it. And I think, I think this pandemic, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of good things. I did a post on LinkedIn about the good things I see coming out of COVID-19. I think our education system's gonna to get totally overhauled and improved. So there's opportunities in education. Street smart entrepreneurs is playing in that space. I think our healthcare system is gonna get radically improved. I think we're gonna find faster ways to approve new products. I think we're gonna rely less on overseas suppliers. I think corporate America is gonna get leaner, more nimble, more competitive, because we're gonna get rid of overhead that, that we don't need. You know, there's a lot of real estate on the market that is never gonna be get reused by the same companies. So I, I think there's a lot of things working in our favor to really spur entrepreneurs to be successful. And, and there's always money looking for good ideas. I mean, I don't think there's ever an absence of money. You might have to work a little harder, be a little bit smarter, give up a little bit bigger piece. But in, in one of the lessons I learned up until uh, I left McKinsey, I mean, I had like a textbook black background when my colleges and my two early jobs, I was with leading organizations globally. And I had never spent any time thinking about networking, realizing how important networking is or doing any networking. So I left Yale, MIT, Harvard, Elliott Automation and McKinsey and the army and didn't stay in touch with anybody I met in any of those places. And I can't imagine how different my life would be if I, if I had just understood the importance of meeting people, building relationships. So I have used networking in lieu of money and in lieu of having a lot of talented people around me, I've used networking to really build everything I've ever tried to build. And it's, I think it's a skill that should be taught in every school and it's not. So prior to starting Street Smart Entrepreneurs, part of my time in the previous four or five years was teaching people how to network and build relationships, both to accelerate their careers and to drive the growth of organizations. So I, I coach people at Deloitte, JP Morgan Chase, Colgate Palmolive, Fordham University, RPI. So I'm very passionate about helping people improve their networking skills. In one of the courses that we're developing for Street Smart is one to teach entrepreneurs how to network to accelerate the launch and growth of their businesses. Because I think that's the real key. End of the story. If I, thank you so much. This is very inspirational. Do you have um, any specific advice for social entrepreneurs where the social aspect is perhaps more important than the financial returns? Uh, I'm not sure how different they are. I've been involved in several nonprofit. I mentioned earlier that my wife has a foundation. I spent 10 years on the board of a nonprofit called Medical Missions for Children. That was a global initiative to use technology to help children 
worldwide, health-wise. Um, I, I don't see much difference. I, I think you have different funding issues. How do you raise the funding? But, but one of uh, my sort of philosophies about that is a nonprofit might think about having a for-profit component where you can generate profits through the operating unit and flow those back into the nonprofit. Like at Medical Missions for Children, uh, the founder set up two or three for-profit companies that he was able to, you know, take money out of and use it to fund the work of the nonprofit. Uh, I'm currently helping a guy in New York create an incubator uh, for women and minority owned entrepreneur organizations that are doing things in the, in the green space. So we're currently thinking about how do we fund that operation? And uh, so I, I think the challenges are, are very similar. And uh, I think you have to, I think you have to have a passion for what your mission is. You have to be able to handle risk and rejection. Uh, one, one key thing I think is important for all entrepreneurs is I think you have to have family support. You know, unless my wife could roll with the punches when I told her we were gonna buy a cheap racehorse and I was gonna quit my job. You know, I would have had no shot. So, you know, sometimes Judy rolls her eyes when I say, she hates for me to say two things and I say them both every day. What's for dinner? And her eyes roll in her head and I got an idea. And that's the one that really gets me. <laughs> so I, I don't see much difference between starting a nonprofit and starting a for-profit organization. That's a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I guess along those same lines, when you talk about impact, um, when, and also with the like a social entrepreneurship venture, um, what is more important? Maybe if it were a green business, would it be the 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 revenue or the income made, or would it be what it's doing for the the environment? I, I think both are important. I mean, you're not going to have a successful nonprofit that doesn't figure out how to generate revenues to support the mission. So you got to be able to figure out that part of it. You got to have a good business model. And I've seen a lot of for-profit and nonprofit organizations fail because they don't modify their business model. They stick with the same thing. And I don't think you can do that, particularly in this day and age where everything's changing so rapidly. So as an entrepreneur, you got to keep multiple balls in the air. You got to you got to be executing against the mission. You got to be generating whatever funding support you need. You got to be attracting the right talent team to work with you. You got to be doing a great job of serving your clients, whoever they are. So, you know, all these things it's like a jigsaw and you got to put it all together. And there's no one thing in my mind that's more important than the rest. I've seen them fail for all kinds of reasons. Would you consider one that maybe broke even at the end of the year a yeah. fail? Sure, I think breaking evens could be heroic in some situations. I, I, there's a lot of ventures that never break even. So I don't, I don't think it's about maximizing the bottom line, but I think it is about generating enough cash flow to do what you're trying to do. I never really, you know, this is one of my weaknesses. I really don't worry about the bottom line. I worry about doing the very best job I can do, trying to execute on the, on the plan that we have and accomplish our mission. I think, I think money takes care of itself if you're doing everything else right. I can't imagine if Street Smart Entrepreneurs is successful, why it won't be financially successful. You know, we're gonna have so many oars in the, in the water. We're gonna have so many great relationships that we're trying to leverage. You know, we're trying to do this globally. I'm already developing relationships in Pakistan and India. You know, I mentioned before Turkey as recently as yesterday. 
So. Gotcha. So assets is, uh, assets can be more than just the the bottom line. Oh, for sure. I, I think I think your biggest asset in any business are your relationships. Mm -hmm. I think that's your biggest personal asset and your biggest business asset. Gotcha. And, you know, I went from being a terrible at meeting people to now being pretty good at it, good enough to write a book about it. But, you know, I, I really value and I think as a parent, I think parents should be teaching their kids to network. We got our son his first business cards when he was about 12 years old. Jonathan was always a good golfer and we would take him to a golf course, drop him off to play golf with people he never met. He'd have a good time and he'd have no way to stay in touch with them. So I said, Jonathan, you got to have business cards and you got to get their business card and give them your card so you can connect to have another round of golf. So Jonathan, you know, originally was shy and introverted about it, but he eventually got over that. And now he's a really successful, powerful developer of relationships. End of the lecture. So have you um, now switched to Zoom? Uh, is that your new meeting place? How do you function when you can't really go and meet people in person? I think, I think I've only had one, maybe two meetings in person since March. And uh, I almost feel at a disadvantage now because I have no downtime. My downtime used to be riding the train or in a car. Now I don't have any downtime. I, I may have a Zoom call every hour for eight straight hours. So I'm being a lot more productive in this period of time, you know, in terms of growing my network and meeting people and discovering opportunities, I've got much less time to work on doing my book or doing some other stuff. But I think uh, Zoom is teaching all of us how to be more effective, you know, on a much, on a much easier basis. I don't, I don't think all these people who are working from home are going to be happy to get back on a train and spend two hours getting into New York City every day. So they're going to have to reinvent themselves, either by finding a company that is more nimble than the one they were with and is open to accommodating a mobile workforce, or they're going to have to start their own ventures. And now with the technologies that we have, you know, and with the, it becoming a global marketplace, I think it's just a great time for people who have, you know, the ingenuity and the drive and the ability to handle risk, to think about doing something on their own, even if it's part-time. You could have a full-time day job and be doing this stuff at night or on the weekend until you build momentum. So when, when I talk to people about raising money for their company, I tell them, don't quit your day job. So you don't have to raise the money to pay your salary. Keep your day job, but work till midnight and work Saturday and Sundays you know, put in your entrepreneurial time on your free time. So there's a, 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 one of my philosophies about raising money is there's a lot of creative ways to do it besides selling equity and taking on debt. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, first of all, don't spend it. Be really cautious about what you spend money on. And then, you know, use the second family income so you don't have to take a paycheck. Don't put in expensive perks into the company. I've seen small companies go broke because the owners had expensive perks. They were, they were unwilling to give up fancy cars and life insurance policies. And so, you know, you gotta be smart about things. You don't have to be a genius, but you gotta be, you gotta be street smart. You can't do dumb things. Um, this is a woman's foundation and our mandate is really to try to help women to thrive. Do you, do you think there's something um, 
some advice you can give? I know you have tried to help uh, high school uh, girls to become entrepreneurs. Uh, is there something that you think we may not be aware of in terms of setting up our businesses or our foundations and attracting people to support us? Uh, my wife's foundation also did things for pro professional and corporate women. For example, she used to run an annual health summit for women and usually on a Saturday and that would be 300 women showing up. And she also used to run financial summits for women, uh, helping women uh, become more effective at taking charge of their personal finances. So she, she did that for 10 years. And I helped in every one of those situations. Um, I think, uh, I think sometimes women are maybe a little bit reluctant to network with guys, which I think, you know, I'm not a woman, so I don't have that issue, but some women are reluctant to reach out to men. I find that becoming less and less going forward. I think the internet may be helping break that down. But in, in general, I mean, in everything I do, I run across amazing women doing amazing things. And I, I don't think gender is a barrier in any way to being successful. I think that could be a cop out for other reasons why somebody's not being a success. I think the idea has to be good. The plan for executing it has to be good. The team that you put together has to be good. Uh, you have to be able to roll with the punches, react quickly. So speed of reaction is a, an asset that you need. But I don't think any longer it's really gender specific. Like I just reached out before I got on this call, I saw Carly Fiorina, who was a presidential candidate being interviewed, I think on Fox around noontime. I reached out to her because I think uh, I should try to establish a relationship with her in Street Smart Entrepreneurs. I went to her website and see what she's doing. So I, I think women are in a great position. You know, I think enlightened guys are going to, you know, rely more on tapping into the power of women. Like I, I mentioned earlier, Leslie, I want to have, you know, equal number of women advisors on my street smart entrepreneurial thing. I'm certainly going to have an equal number of women guest lectures in my programs. So I, I think I think the days of uh, women being severely disadvantaged, you know, I know there's still inequalities in a lot of places, but I, I don't think that's a real bar barricade to success or doing your own thing. It could actually be an advantage. So what's next on your uh, kind of dream list? Uh, is, is this entrepreneurial um, enterprise going to, you know, take a few years? Is that what you're focused on? I've got two, two ground rules relative to time. The 24 hour ground rule, Jack's ground rule, is that you got to get back to people within 24 hours or they forget about you. So Hopefully I hear from all of you within 24 hours. So that's, that's one key to building relationships is fast follow-up. The second rule I have is the one year rule. And I think anything significant takes a year to develop. So from the time my wife and I decided to breed one of our female horses and went through the process of picking a stallion and shipping the mare to Canada, Kentucky to getting her impregnated, having a baby, that takes a year. So get really getting street smart entrepreneurs off the ground is going to take me a year. I, I would say a year from May, we'll be on pretty solid footing. We'll be generating revenues. You know, the heat of uh, keeping the thing going financially, hopefully will be over. And, you know, who knows where that's going to go? 
Maybe that turns into a book publishing company. Or I certainly think we should be thinking about doing a TV show. You know, not to rip off the Shark Tank, but I, I think there's a, the basis of a TV show in the people that I'm running across. They're, I'm meeting amazing people. And I think one of the things that really speaks well for the future of our country is how, how below the surface, how many incredible people are doing incredible things that aren't getting any visibility. But we, we had this layer of real creativity and entrepreneurship and people creating things. I, I think the country could be in very good standing going forward, but everything takes a year. And, you know, Street Smart Entrepreneurs evolved out of uh, my view of the pandemic, creating opportunities. And at the time I had spent four years consulting with a software company. And after four years, I really grew to not feel comfortable with the leadership of the company. And it was time to make a change. So I'm getting ready to jump ship out of that relationship. And I'm paying attention to the pandemic. And I'm thinking here I have all this entrepreneurial expertise or experiences. Why am I wasting my time with this software company when I could be trying to really impact people with what I, by sharing what I know and what I can do? So I, I resigned on a Friday from my consulting gig with the software company, called a lawyer on Monday and told him to form a company for me. I'm ready to rock and roll. So I don't know where I'll be a year from now or what I might come across. In the back of my mind, I'd like to run a university one day. I'm probably getting too old to do that, but it's still in the back of my mind. So who knows? Jack, what's the name of your networking book? So you it's okay. called Network All the Time, Everywhere with Everybody. It's on Amazon. And up until COVID, I did 90% of my networking at breakfast. That's the, that's the book. So I did 90% of my networking at breakfast. So I was thinking about having to uh, include an egg on the cover. <laughs> so I, I went to uh, free images and I downloaded different poached eggs, scrambled eggs. And I tried them on the covers and it just didn't look right. And one day I'm riding around in a car and I'm thinking, you know, what am, what's the message I'm trying to convey? And the message is really network all the time, everywhere with everybody. So I said, that should be the title of the book. And it's really true. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm being pretty modest here, but I, I think I've changed people's lives by showing them how to do this. And it's a life-changing skill. You know, if you, if you de develop the ability to meet people and develop relationships and not keep score of what you're getting out of it, just focusing on adding value to other people, it just blows the doors open on opportunities. And, and if you get good at it, like in my book, I talk about random networking, just meeting people randomly. And I talk about targeted networking and targeted networking can change your whole life, your whole career. Uh, for example, uh, when, when my father died and he, he owned the farm that Judy and I own now, and we didn't have any money to buy a 50 acre farm in New Jersey. And, and he had left instructions to his executors to sell everything and put the money in the trust. So the executors were under pressure to sell the farm and the horses he owned and the company, well, the company was worthless and they didn't wanna run a company. So I cut a deal with the executors that they would give me and Judy 30 days to raise a matching amount of money once they had a firm offer for the farm. So a couple of months went by, they came up with an offer for the farm. And then they called me up and said, Jack, you got 30 days to match the offer. And we still didn't have any money. So how do you raise enough money to buy a 50 acre farm in 30 days? So I was down in Kentucky selling advertising for country music magazine to the cigarette companies. And I got an idea I asked the receptionist, could I use your phone? And I called the secretary of agriculture, cold call, 
targeted cold call in Washington. I didn't get him, but I got his assistant and I described the situation. I said, look, I'm broke. I don't have enough money to buy a farm, but I want to buy 50 acres. I want to keep it as a farm. I don't want to turn it into a housing development, which must be your objective too. So do you have any programs to help new people buy farms? And he said, yeah, we have a whole bunch of programs. So they steered me to getting 80% of the money I needed as a loan from the Department of Agriculture. And then I called the people that put up the money to start country music. And I said, I would like to sell you my interest in country music for X dollars. They said, well, you're doing a great job running Harper's and country music. We don't want you to leave. I said, I'm not gonna leave. I just need to raise some money. And they said, why? And I told them, they said, I don't think we're gonna buy, you know, buy you out. So they called me the next day and they said, we're not gonna buy you out, but there's a check in the mail to you for what you need. We're gonna loan it to you. So I, I made the 30 day cutoff and with two days to spare by targeted networking. So when, our, when Jonathan was 12 years old, he was a good little league baseball player. I could encourage him and motivate him, but I couldn't show him how to throw different pitches. I'm a Yankee groupie. So I reached out to the pitching coach of the Yankees with a letter and said, would you be willing to meet my son and talk to him about the nuances of pitching? And he got back to me right away. So be happy to do that. So targeted networking against very specific goals is really a key thing to be comfortable doing. Jeremy, you're being quiet. I'm. I, I keep on unmuting, but you uh, you are saying interesting things. <laughs> I'm not a mute, no sir, <laughs> definitely not. You said you didn't network when you were first out uh, uh, in the world of business, but what right. made you realize that networking was uh, what was the uh, the realization that, well, that made quit, it so important? When I quit my job in McKinsey. Mm -hmm. I described no money, no clients, no office, no partners, no business cards. I would go, we lived in New Jersey. I would go into New York with a pocket full of quarters, go to Grand Central or Penn Station and cold call people. And I hated it. I mean, I absolutely hated it. If the phone would ring three times and they didn't pick up, I would hang up like I accomplished something. <laughs> but if I didn't do that, they weren't gonna call me. And I had put my, I had sawed the limb off. You know, nobody was going to come chasing me with deals or with money to invest in deals. So unless I got over my shyness and my awkwardness and cold called people, I, I was going to starve. And that wasn't a very good option. And the, and the very first guy that really was receptive to, to my call was a guy running money in America for the Rothschild funding family in Europe. And I happened to get the guy responsible for the Rothschild money in America. And I stumbled my way on the payphone, trying to talk fast so the operator wouldn't come on and say, deposit another 25 cents. <laughs> and he said, of course, I'll be happy to meet with you. Come on down. So I went down and I met with him and he was more than willing I told him, I want to learn what your investment objectives are. So if I ever run across a deal in the future and I call you, you will know that I think there's a fit. So he was perfectly happy to tell me what kind of deals he was looking for. And that gave me confidence to call Jack Dreyfus at the Dreyfus Fund in banks, in law firms and insurance companies. So I, I just forced myself to do it and get better at it. And what, what happened, an unexpected benefit resulted because I was concentrating on calling sources of money first, but they found it much easier rather than turning down a deal that they had seen to tell the, the entrepreneur, look, this isn't for us. It's not the kind of thing we do, but why don't you call our new friend, Jack? He might be able to help you. So the Rothschilds and the Dreyfuses and the Citibanks, they start sending their rejected deals to me. So I got buried with a, with a, a pipeline of deals to look at. So, and, and in every business I've been in since, I've had to network within a different community. My, my contacts for 
manufacturing were of no value in the horse racing business. So I had to create new relationships there. And they were no value in the hedge fund industry. So I had to create new relationships there. So it's just been, in right now I'm developing new relationships in the entrepreneurial space through Street Smart Entrepreneurs. I got off the phone just before I came on this call with the small business SBA, talking to them about how, how do we partner together? So every environment that you're in, I think you should really concentrate on maximizing the quality of your, of your networking connections. I think that's your real resource. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure Leslie and Mingi can really blow the doors off this uh, China US Women's Foundation just by leveraging the contacts that they have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good answer. I like how you're fearless about, about approaching people who seem like they're too, too important, too big to talk to you or to me. But yeah, I, I think- I come yeah. from a very modest background and mentioned blue collar parents, right? Right. But unless you make the call, they are not going to call you. So, uh -huh. so when, when we came out with the first copy of Country Music Magazine, we thought it was the world's best. The cover story <laughs> was about Johnny Cash performing at the White House. This is when President Nixon was in, in office. So we went out that night to drink a bunch of sangrias and celebrate that we got the magazine back from the printers and we're talking. How do we get the magazine to President Nixon and how do we get him to endorse it? So we're talking and one of us had a contact with a Tennessee state senator. So we sent the state senator a copy of our magazine with a note asking him if he would pass on the magazine and a note we had enclosed to President Nixon, which he was happy to do. So within a week, I had a letter back from President Nixon thanking me for the magazine so every time we went on an ad sales call after that, I could take a letter from the White House on their stationery with me. <laughs> and when he was invited to open the new Grand Old Opry at Opryland, I got invited to go as part of the press party that he put together to go to Opryland. And then when Jimmy Carter was in office, I was still on our radar screen. I was still publishing the magazine. So he, he raised a lot of money from the country music industry. And he had a country music night at the White House. And I got invited to dinner at the White House with Jimmy Carter and Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash. And, but you know, you have to be prepared to break out of your comfort zone. Yeah, that's for sure. With one more one more question also about with your father's biz, which you said you weren't enthralled with. Uh, what what allowed you to find the right solutions to to grow that company and in general, you know, if you do you feel like that's a, a talent that you did have as a, as a child or growing yeah. up? Or? I, I can't change the light bulb. And my father <laughs> could <wire> it. <laughs> so I don't have any of those skills. <laughs> when I got there and, and I saw the condition of the company, you know, spending the five years looking at other entrepreneurial deals and then starting Country Music Magazine, you know, that gave me like a 10 year window of looking at deals and working with entrepreneurs and thinking like an entrepreneur. So when I walked into my father's company on that Saturday morning and I saw how bad it was, you know, I felt like I was, like I had been perfectly trained to take on that challenge. And uh, I made two decisions, that, I made three decisions that, that day. I was going to stop drinking anything, no liquor. I was going to start jogging that day because I knew I was going to have to be super fit to run three different businesses every day, seven days a week. And I was not going to put out an obituary on my father because if anybody knew he died, the employees wouldn't come to work. The customers would stop calling. So. That's, that's one of my real regrets to this day that my poor father never had an obituary. So maybe when I go, we'll, put, we'll do a two for one deal, get a discount. But, you know, I sat there, I went into his uh, company. I showed up late on Monday morning because I wanted everybody to be working 
before I showed up. So I, I showed up about eight o'clock or quarter to eight. They all start at 7.30. They're all out there on their machines doing their little thing. And I walked out and I told them, shut the machines off. I introduced myself. I said, my father passed away on Saturday. I said, the company's in horrible shape. We got 20 bucks in the bank. I owed a whole bunch of money. I said, I got enough money to make this Friday's payroll. I said, I don't know where we're gonna come up with any more money. I said, but if you're afraid of the situation, you should just leave. And I'm sorry that that happened, but if you're willing to give me a chance to salvage the thing, go back to what you're doing, because I can't tell you what to do. I have no idea what you should be doing. And let me go back in the office and figure out what to do next. And nobody quit. And I went back in the office and I figured, you know, I saw all the letters from the creditors and bank. So I told my father's assistant, I want you to call, get, I'm gonna go sit in his office. When you see the light go off on my phone, call the next creditor on the list. She had given me a list of people we owed money to. So in the first day I called all the creditors and I called the banks and I said, my father died, we're broke, we have no money. If you blow the whistle on us, everybody's gonna get nothing. I said, so I'm asking you to give us time. I don't know why we were dealing with you if you're a supplier, but put us on COD so you don't get hurt every, any worse. Every Friday, I'll either send you an updating memo on the progress I made in saving this place, or I'll save you, I'll send you some money. Might just be a buck. I said, but you won't get hurt any worse. And every creditor backed off. And then I called all the companies that we had work in process with on day two on Tuesday. And that was J&J &J and Monsanto and Dow Chemical. And I told them my father died. We got a, your, your order is partway done. You put up a third deposit. We don't have enough money to finish it. So unless you send us 100% prepay for the order, by Friday so we can make payroll, you're gonna lose your deposit and you're gonna to have to go find somebody else to build your equipment. Every company sent me a check by Friday, except one mid-sized company in Detroit flew in to meet me, I guess to see if he could really trust me. But by Friday, everybody had prepaid their money. No creditor was blowing the whistle on us. We had cash in the bank and I never raised another dime of money. End of the story. Great story. Thank you. <laughs> really. I find it so helpful to hear that kind of can do spirit. Um, and it really is encouraging uh, for us. Um, and I can see uh, your streetwise entrepreneurs could really inspire a whole new generation. Um, so hopefully we can continue our conversation. You know, that really is what we're trying to do is to help women to thrive um, and entrepreneurship and financial acumen. These are all qualities that are so important for women and who maybe haven't had that kind of experience. So I hope we can continue our conversation, maybe find ways we can work together and uh, continue to keep everyone, our audiences updated about our progress. No, for sure. I, I'd love to find ways to add value to what you're doing. You're doing an important thing. And you're, in, you're at the very early stages and I think you could have a real global impact. And I don't think this eventually has to be limited to US and China women. I think you could expand this into a global footprint and really bring women together to create real wealth and you know good things for the world. I think you got a world vision here. Well, I think with your help, Jack, maybe we can be successful. So, and I won't take uh, more than 24 hours to reach out to you again. That's really a takeaway that I'll, I'll 
put into action. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It's really been a pleasure to be together. I think the main point is that we've sat together, we've shared interesting conversation. Jack has shared with us um, really some good ideas plus his experience. So let's continue the conversation. Let's uh, everyone be in touch and together, I'm sure um, we will thrive. All right, whatever I can do to help, um, that's what I want to do. Okay. Thank you so much. It was Thank fascinating. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Everyone, be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.